Hello, every good day, and thank you for joining us, Lighting Design Lab, for our class of network lighting controls for warehouses. My name is Armando Berdiel, technical development supervisor. I'm going to be emceeing with you guys today. And our presenter for today is Eric Strandberg, our senior lighting specialist. Next slide, please. Uh, let's see. Hang on one moment. There we go. Thank you. All right. As you will have noticed, uh, just a few a few ground rules before we, we get started. You're going to be muted. Uh, however, please use the chat feature to engage with us, ask us questions, send us comments, some things you like. Uh, we will be stopping periodically to answer some of these questions live and, and, and be answered right in the chat itself. Uh, we're going to have a couple of online polls today, so please participate in, on, in, in, these, in these polls. Uh, following the class, we're going to have a big 30 second, one minute survey of, on, on, on our performance today, so please take the survey. Uh, a recording of, of the class as well as uh, a slide deck handout will be posted on the Lighting Designs website. Uh, any additional questions or comments, you can please write to us at lightingdesignlab at seattle.gov. Uh, as always, we want to make sure that everyone is aware Lighting Design Lab is a program empowering Seattle City Light or Municipality here in the city of Seattle. Uh, just very happy to work with Seattle, Seattle City Light in order to bring you this program. Uh, Oh, just a second here. All as well. And I'd like to give a special thank you to Better Britain Northwest Energy Agency Alliance for helping sponsor this webinar for the day. You can advance to the next slide as well. A uh, little bit about who the Lighting Design Lab works with. Uh, we work with a good amount of trade allies. This is your uh, your contractors, implementers, and, and trade allies that work with utilities and that retrofit market. We work a lot also with design allies. These are your building engineers, architects, lighting designers, specifiers that work a lot in the new construction market. Although both of these markets have this hunger for knowledge and, and we come together at the Lighting Design Lab to provide that best practices and emerging technology awareness uh, around lighting that we can. And also we work with end users, your building operators that are, that are a key piece to adopting these emerging lighting technologies. Uh, and again, take us to work with a good amount of strategic partners that help us put together our programming. Uh, we also have our core service areas. We do education and training, so as webinar today, hands-on workshops where we have people commission network lighting control systems live and hopefully we'll come back to that model soon. We do technology evaluation, we pilots, we oversee emerging technology devices and, and evaluations around them. We also develop tools and resources such as luminaire level lighting control videos and network lighting control best practice guides that you can find on our website. So we do a good amount of information that is us keeping our ear close to the ground of what's happening in the lighting and being able to disseminate that information to our audience. Next slide, please. All right, well, without further ado, I leave you guys with Eric. Thanks, Armando. Can, uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. If you cannot hear me, um, please uh, raise your hand or let, uh, let us know in the chat. Um, What's that, Armando? I'm going to move forward here. Um, all right. Uh, so um, any of you who've taken our classes before probably have seen me. I've been at the lab uh, since 1995. Um, I've seen lots of change in the industry and um, been involved in many aspects of it. Um, we do, uh, you know, uh, lighting design uh, and conservation. Uh, we, as uh, as Armando said, we're developing classes and presenting classes, and I've written articles on all kinds of topics and uh, technology evaluation and project consultation. So I love lighting. Um, it's uh, it's an exciting field, and it's not getting any less exciting uh, as we go. So. Um, I think there's a little survey that uh, we're going to take and find out a little bit about you. Yeah. 
You got it. I'm launching it right now. Okay. So it's going to be slightly different than what we see on screen, but it's going to give us a good idea of, hey, who do we have in our audience? So which more closely resembles you? Are you a manufacturer, uh, part of a rep agency, a specifier, a liner, a design ally? Are you a trade ally, a mentor, or are you, some, are you a utility staff or, or program developer for utilities? Be great for us to know. Oh, wow, this is pretty even spread. Thank you for all that have voted. I'm gonna close this out in about three, 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 five more seconds. All right, I am going, thanks again for all those voting. I'm gonna close and share. So good amount of representation from rep, reps, trade allies, utility staff, and a good amount of more uh, product specifiers. So thank you all for voting. Good to be even spread. All right, thank you. Excellent. Uh, just FYI, Armando, I'm not seeing the poll results, but um, so if you just talk about it, then uh, then that's then I'll I'll know what's uh, what's coming up. Perfect. But, I'll call yeah. them out. Very good. All right, moving on. Um, right. So. Uh, you know, energy efficiency is uh, is one of the things that the utilities are very interested in. And, um, you know, in a warehouse, lighting can represent a very high percentage of the energy use uh, in a warehouse. Um, obviously, certain warehouses or types of, you know, if you have a cold storage facility, um, that's going to be dominated by your uh, mechanical systems and your chillers. Um, but for the most part, a typical warehouse uses about 60% uh, of their energy costs are lighting. And so those are operating costs that can be saved. Um, you know, just switching to LED, uh, as we'll touch on later, um, can save a, a huge amount of energy. Um, and uh, that's that said, I see plenty of warehouses where, um, you know, they're still using the older technologies, whether it be metal halide or even fluorescent. Uh, there's still a lot of energy to be saved. And then you layer onto that uh, controls, particularly networked uh, controls, as we'll see uh, later on, you can save uh, even more energy. Uh, so that's what we're going to try and uh, talk about today. We're going to look at uh, some of the common control strategies, I think, to, to know what the advantages are of network lighting controls. It's it's good to see what uh, what might be out there. Most warehouses don't have much in the way of controls at all. And so uh, rather than going to just sort of basic controls, which is, which would be progress, uh, going straight to network lighting controls would be uh, ideal. Um, we're gonna look at some of the uh, controls uh, that are available. We'll also review how controls might relate to some of the current uh, lighting um, and health research that we're seeing. Uh, we're becoming more and more concerned and aware that uh, people spend a lot of time inside interior spaces and the lighting can have a big impact, uh, not only on health, but also on productivity, uh, which comes right into the bottom line. And then we'll review practical applications of some of the uh, uh, control strategies that might be specific and particular to warehouses. So obviously, you know, most people, when you think of a warehouse, you think of the storage areas, whether it be aisles or open storage. Uh, and in fact, that's the dominant type of space. Uh, but there's lots of other spaces that even might be, you might think are part of, you know, that that big open storage area, but really have different needs. Shipping and receiving uh, is gonna be different than your aisles. Um, the loading dock areas, uh, maintenance uh, areas, uh, those are gonna have different needs, even though they might seem to be closely associated. And then of course, there'll be uh, offices of different kinds. Um, there'll be spaces for the staff, whether it be break rooms uh, or, um, you know, showers and, and restrooms. Uh, and then there may be customer areas. You may have a big will call uh, counter and that may have different lighting needs uh, and different, you know, and and uh, and then different controls 
would be uh, uh, optimized for those. So um, this class is specific to controls, but we're just going to take a, a little very brief overview of some modern warehouse lighting strategies and how things maybe have changed a little bit. Um, obviously, one of the big changes that we've seen is the use of uh, LEDs in uh, whether it be new construction uh, or certainly retrofit. Um, of existing warehouses and really all kinds of architectural spaces, interior and exterior. Uh, so, uh, you know, lots of advantages um, in terms of flexibility, uh, maintenance savings, uh, light quality. So we're going to look at uh, that's that's just going to be an assumption uh, as we go through the impacts uh, that we've seen with LED. Um, you know potentially smaller fixtures. Sometimes these aren't necessarily relevant to every application, but uh, higher efficacy, certainly that's relevant to um, energy savings, um, better better light quality, and we'll see as we go that that's uh, important uh, to productivity. Um, flexible uh, control, we've, you know, it, when you go back to high intensity discharge, the sort of incumbent technology, if you will, you really couldn't control it at all, uh, at least not from a practical standpoint. Um, and then we have um, better optics, reduced maintenance, uh, the ability to dim, um, and then, uh, you know, there is some confusion about how uh, how LEDs are going to impact and how, how to apply them effectively. And we'll look at a little bit of that as we go. Uh, so the IES, the Illuminating Engineering Society, uh, they have recommended practices, their so-called RP series, and they have one recommended practice for lighting for industrial facilities. Um, and, you know, warehouses aren't necessarily particular to an indus industrial applications. Of course, we look at, you know, you might have warehouses for books or warehouses for clothing. Um, but I thought I'd share uh, just a couple little things in in the RP7 uh, for where for industrial facilities that are relevant uh, to lighting that I thought were a little worth worth pointing out. Uh, so, for instance, when you have these racks, um, high racking, uh, regardless of what you're storing. Um, the geometry of the space when you're doing your your calculations, your lighting calculations, you know they have uh, uh, one of the things that we use for calculations is a thing called room cavity ratio uh, to determine how the light is going to reflect in that space. And because they have a very high room cavity ratio, they're very tall, narrow spaces, almost like a phone booth, if anybody remembers phone booths, uh, where you have lots of wall but very little ceiling and floor. Um, typical lumen method of average illuminance is not uh, not really as effective to tell you how that space will feel because it doesn't tell you uh, so much about what's happening on those vertical surfaces. Um, another thing that I thought was interesting was, um, you know, when you're when you're spacing the luminaires in a in an aisle like that. Uh, if you have a significant amount of uplight and uh, you have a reflected uh, ceiling, um, you can space them farther apart. Uh, and traditionally, we've used lighting that just goes straight down in warehouses. Um, but if you have an uplight component, it does allow you possibly to use fewer fixtures and you also get more uniform uh, light distribution. So just a, a little note there. Um, so, you know, obviously a question that comes up when you're doing a lighting design, regardless of the type of space, is how much light do I need? And um, there can be lots of drivers for that. Uh, 
beyond just what you think it, as a designer it might need or what the owner thinks it might need. There's also the IES, the Illuminating Engineering Society, and they have uh, recommendations that they put out. Um, this, these are light levels from the uh, 10th edition uh, handbook. Um, so, and, and it'll vary depending on the type of things that are being stored, whether it's bulky large items or small uh, items with little labels. Um, you know, you're going to require either uh, less light or more light. Um, cold storage, open warehouse, uh, and aisles are all going to have slightly different, whether they're average uh, foot can horizontal or uh, a range. And then there's vertical. Uh, as I said, you know, most of what you're lighting in a warehouse is vertical storage, um, at least once you get into the, uh, the, the uh, high racking spaces. So there's recommendations. Uh, there's also the local codes. In, in the case of Washington State, there's the WAC, the Washington Admit Administrative Code. Um, it typically, that will be based on IS recommendations, but not always. So it doesn't hurt to uh, double check to see if there's uh, requirements for certain kinds of, especially if you're doing a, you know, like maybe a school, maybe they have warehousing. Uh, or a hospital or some other type of space. Um, and then there's OSHA uh, safety regulations, and those would trump any of these. Uh, typically, they are aligned, um, but that's really the one that's going to, you know, if OSHA requires 15 foot candles and the IS recommends 10, uh, you better put in 15 foot candles. Um, so, uh, and then, of course, the rec oh, Washington Administrative Code usually will will relate to that, but not always. So, how much light um, do you need? And then there's how much light will you get? Uh, so, here's a an LED fixture uh, comes in a couple different types, um, and uh, different lumen packages. And so you think, well, thirty thousand lumens, you know, that's how much light I'm going to get, you know, or or something, but you actually have to do a calculation uh, based on the space, and that'll give you a sense of how many foot candles that 30,000 lumens will reveal. Um, but there's lots to choose from. Even in the 30,000 lumens, we have all these choices. So let's just take a look here at uh, something that can be um, uh, a big factor depending on the type of space that you're lighting. So here we have our 30,000 lumen fixture. Uh, and, um, you know, we have different choices of reflectors, lenses, um, voltages, different driver types, but different colors and different color renderings. And so those are going to be pretty important here. So if we take a basic 4,000 Kelvin 70 CRI uh, fixture, we're going to get 29,000 and a half lumens, so that's pretty close to our 30,000 lumens, um, and that would be perfectly fine uh, for most applications. But let's say you're doing um, uh, a warehouse uh, where they want high color rendering. Maybe they're looking at little components uh, that need to be separated uh, accurately and quickly. Um, and they want 3,000 kelvins. Uh, they don't want the the, the wider light. Uh, they want a warmer light for some reason. Well, now we're only at 18,000 and a half lumens. So we go from something with our 4,000 kelvin 70 CRI. We got uh, 125 lumens per watt uh, down to an 80 lumens per watt. Um, you know that may just be what what you have to do. Uh, it's not always a case of just doing, you know, the the highest lumens per watt. Uh, it, but you you need to know that once you go to this other package, you're going to get. You may need more fixtures. Uh, it's also possible your incentives if you're getting if you're working with a utility. Uh, you it it may be that they're requiring something that's over say 100 lumens per watt. Uh, so then you have to talk to them, or you may. Um, to negotiate for something, or you may just, you just don't want any surprises to find out that now you're not going to get an incentive or you're, uh, for some reason, not that those fixtures are not allowed. Maybe you're doing a lead building. 
uh, elite warehouse. So anyway, you have to look very carefully uh, at those things. And additionally, you know, depending on whether how your lensing is going, that could affect um, the various lumen packages. So um, just a heads up there. Uh, you know, these are the photometric files for just that one fixture. So um, when when people say, well, how much light will I get? It's like, well, which fixture are you using, and you know, how many how many variations do we want to look at? Um, someone said not long ago that isn't lighting getting easier? It's just LED now. But you know, in some ways, there's more choices. Uh, with metal halide, you pretty much had one choice. You had different lumens, different wattages, but it was all 4,000 Kelvin, 70 CRI mostly. Um, so anyway, network lighting uh, control systems. You know, just like the uh, the LED, uh, the light fixtures aren't a, a, a monolith. You know, there's all different kinds of network lighting control systems too. Uh, some are very simple. Um, some are fairly complex. Uh, some uh, try to do most of the work for you, and others give you a lot more choices. Uh, so It'll be, um, you know, they're not all the same, and I guess there's, and but they don't, and and that's a good thing. But you need you need to get a, a sense of what it is your goals are going to be, and what's most appropriate. Um, typically, they're a distributed control system. You're going to have uh, manual controls or manual input devices, whether they be dimming or just switching, uh, that people can interact with for your various zones. Uh, then you may have uh, sensors that are controlling those same zones. So here you have Z1 can, can be controlled manually or a sensor can control that. Here we have uh, this sensor is controlling a whole range of zones uh, 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 through this different this uh, load controller. Um, so how you arrange that uh, can be somewhat complex. Um, they can be integrated or standalone, uh, scalable, whether you're doing, you know, a, a big complex warehouse or just a small, uh, smaller facility. Um, so, uh, yeah. So that's a system, if we go back, where it's just distributed, where it's just sort of, a, we'll say, a kit of parts and you've got all your different kind of devices. There are ways to go where you have luminaire level lighting controls, where each each fixture has all the controller, uh, all the sensors built into it, and has uh, some uh, ways of communicating back to uh, your main um, your main con uh, controller, and that could be uh, a real advantage for a variety of reasons, and we'll look at that uh, as we go, but. It allows um, each fixture is basically its own zone, right? So highly granular uh, uh, controls, and we'll see that that can add to savings. Um, potentially very simple to specify and install. It's all going to be integrated, so it should all be compatible, and you're generally just in putting them up and wiring them uh, out of the box. Um, they do require commissioning. Uh, I mean, they, they'll often have some functionality right out of the box, but you generally have to turn them on and do some uh, some programming. Um, so yeah, and then uh, they can be more flexible uh, as well. So you you can get different functionality uh, layered onto those. And then there's power over Ethernet. Um, you know, those are set systems where rather than um, running uh, line voltage, whether it be uh, 120 or 277 to each fixture, you've got uh, a, basically a data cable uh, where you've got your uh, data lines, this is a CAT5 or CAT6, um, cable going from each fixture and each uh, input device back to a router and uh, 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 software uh, setup. 
Um, it does give you great flexibility. You are running a lot of these uh, uh, wire bundles, um, but it does give you um, a lot of flexibility. And with, I guess, with the LED uh, age, if we can call it that, you know, our we're we're our loads are low enough at the fixture level that we're not necessarily uh, we're able to just run that through uh, the power through those. I, I, I will say for a warehouse application, most of the fixtures, even though they're LED, they're going to be a couple hundred watts uh, per fixture uh, unless it's a small space. So I'm not sure this is quite something that we're going to be seeing in, in warehouse applications though. So different manufacturers uh, have different different branded products, and as we go, we'll see that um, they are there's a lot out there, but there's there's a lot of commonality between them. Uh, but there are some differences, so you can really uh, you can kind of tailor your system for uh, for for your own needs. Uh, but we have uh, Acuity, um, we have Cooper, Cree. Uh, Lutron, all the major players are involved in these uh, with these products. Uh, so what are we looking at? Uh, you know, we're looking at distributed systems, as I mentioned. Most of these are going to have uh, a a lot of a, most a, a wireless component. Uh, sometimes they can be completely wireless. Uh, obviously, you're powering your fixtures. But in terms of the control uh, portion of it, um, the, the all the control uh, elements could be wireless. Uh, sometimes there's a wired and wireless section, uh, just depending on how you how you want to lay set it up. Um, more compatibility, uh, more complex, less complicated, and that's actually an interesting variation here. So the complexity is increased, but they're simpler uh, in many ways uh, than than they had been historically. Uh, the prices are coming down, uh, especially when you're looking at an LL luminaire level lighting control system. Uh, they're very easy to install, and that said, even the uh, even the ones where you have s discrete sensors uh, are are fairly simple, especially if they're wireless. Um, we have compatibility between manufacturers and various components, uh, and they're integrated uh, to other building systems or integrated more with them within the, with the manufacturer, and they're just generally better uh, than they had been. Uh, so, it, you know, in improving and lower cost, we're seeing that trend uh, with lots of technologies. Okay, so here's a uh, a uh, little pop quiz. Sounds good. Getting ready to launch it up. Yeah, and and I guess I would say that. Um, do you want me to read these? Uh, no. Uh, what are I got those? What are some of the benefits of luminaire level lighting control systems? You can select all that apply. Uh, you can have highly granular control. They could be easy to install. Maybe they may have uh, some basic programming out of the box. They could automatically meet code, and uh, hey, LLC is the best option for all spaces. So please select those you think more closely are benefits of luminaire level lighting control system. Thank you for voting. And uh, I see that most people are steering clear of a particular answer. That's great. <laughs> so let's share these results. Yay! Highly granular control. 67% of people voted. 67% also voted for easy to install. Uh, 83 noted some, some benefits of basic pro programming box. 33% noted they automatically need code. And no one voted for LLC is the best option for all spaces. All right. Well, good to know. Um, so typical control strategies, uh, you know, manual switching, manual dimming, uh, scene and preset control, occupancy sensing, vacancy sensing, daylight harvesting, task tuning, time scheduling, and astronomical scheduling. All these are, uh, you know, and it, 
it's not impossible to think you might have all of these strategies in a big complex warehouse type space. Uh, so, you know, and, and as I mentioned earlier, the incumbent technology metal halide, you didn't really even have manual switching. Those with the uh, with their long strike time, you know, you would turn those on in the morning, and that was pretty much it. You know, if if you went out of the room for lunch, uh, you left those lights on uh, because they would take you know minutes to to come on and off. So um, even manual switching, uh, although we will, as we'll see, that's probably not your best best strategy. So we'll look at some of these. Um, right. Uh, it can be line voltage. Uh, you can have low voltage depending on the larger loads that are just sending sending a signal to relays. Uh, they can be uh, in groups or zones. Uh, simple design, easy to understand. Most people know what a switch does. They recognize it, but it may not meet code in many places. And uh, so, just putting in switching uh, is probably not a good plan. Um, manual dimming. Uh, again, can be line voltage or low voltage. Uh, they can be networked. Um, they can be in zones or groups. Uh, fairly simple to design. It's really a lot like manual switching, except that you're now able to control the intensity. Most people understand dimmers. Um, and people generally like personal control. So, um, you know, maybe you're in the shipping receiving area. You don't want as much light. Uh, or another space, a lunchroom, uh, what have you. You may want to uh, tailor the lighting. Again, probably not as applicable in a warehouse application, though. Preset scenes. Um, you know, we think of these as being in uh, uh, boardrooms and conference rooms or presentation areas. But, you know, honestly, when, when we look at some of the strategies we'll talk about later, in some ways, they are sort of uh, scenes, um, but basically, you're you're automatically controlling uh, zones or groups of zones uh, with the press of a single button. Uh, they can be more complicated, but you often get better results. They can be a little confusing to people if you just see a bunch of buttons there; they're not sure what they do or hear. Uh, but if you if you engrave them uh, so people know what what to expect or have a, a graphical user interface uh, that can be uh, a, a real benefit. So here's a little um, uh, video that uh, my colleague uh, Sean put together and we'll take a look. Let's see, I think I'm going to have to, uh, yeah, let's go to the pointer. Maybe, ah, there we go. So, um, yeah, so you can have uh, your basic on-off switch, and notice how this is all being done wirelessly, so the lights go on, uh, or you turn them off uh, with the press of a button, and all of those little groups go on and off. You can have uh, dimming, uh, where you're dimming one light, and you can then dim, uh, go up to full intensity, you can dim it down, uh, and then go back up to full intensity um, and then turn turn the lights off with the touch of a button. Um, here we can dim, uh, turn on the entire bank of lights, a whole, multiple zones, uh, dim them down to a preset level uh, and then dim them back up. Uh, and then we can just turn everything off. And then our fourth possibility that we talked about are scenes where you've got one scene is everything up at full, another scene would be everything say at you know 50%, a third scene would be uh, some zones are off, other zones are up at full, and then the fourth scene would be just everything off. And so that's, again, all done wirelessly. We've got our load controllers here. These could be, you know, shipping, receiving. This could be the, the aisles on the west side, the east side aisles. This could be um, maintenance uh, area. So 
uh, I should say that my colleague Sean is um, uh, taking a side career as a hand model, and so he's going to be working uh, that as well. You could reach out to him if you're interested in more of that work. Um, oops, let's see if we can move on here. We don't we don't need to see it again. Oh, here we go. Ah, there we go. I, I liked it a lot. I just didn't like it that much. Okay, so let's see. I've got my little cursor, my drawing tool, do the spotlight. There we go. So occupancy sensing. Um, so we've seen some of this, the manual switching. We've seen dimming. We've seen scene controllers. Now we have sensors um, that would be doing things automatically. And occupancy is certainly the the primary one that we're thinking about, and uh, that's obviously where lights automatically turn on and then they turn off. Um, you know, they've gotten better than they used to be, but people, you know, the occupancy sensors have been around for decades and they're improving. Um, supplanted by vacancy sensors in many cases, which we'll look at. Uh, so. Occupancy sensors makes, make uh, sense, if you will, in public spaces, quarters, stairwells, uh, restrooms, warehousing, uh, you know, places where you have multiple entrances and exits. It's hard to determine, um, you know, hard to put s manual switches around. Uh, so you just want the lights to come on as people enter and exit a, a, a space that has uh, multiple entry points. Um, uh, let's see here. Stand by. There we go. Vacancy sensing looks exactly like occupancy sensing. In fact, if you, it's the same pictures, same sensors. The difference is that the lights turn off when no one's present automatically, but they require you manually turn them on. And um, <clears throat> there we'd be seeing these um, in places like uh, break rooms, uh, office areas, um, small storage. So there's a difference between a storage area and a warehouse. A storage area usually is a small space, maybe with one door where someone walks in and they would turn a light on. Uh, it's, and it's not a, a, a very large space. Um, and then they turn the light off typically when they leave, or, but if they forget, it automatically goes off. And that's a vacancy sensor. Um, coverage patterns are important in all, every time you're using occupancy sensors or any of the, or vacancy, but in particular with warehouses. So, we see some sensors will have a long, narrow uh, range, uh, like which would be typical in an aisle, but that wouldn't be appropriate if you had a big open space. And sometimes you have a smaller range or a larger range, and you think, well, why don't I just use the the big one everywhere? We just want to get everybody that comes in um, to turn the lights on. But the difference would be. Um, so you have shipping and receiving, and they have hours that go from, uh, you know, maybe they do run two shifts, uh, but your your main warehouse is three shifts. Uh, so every time someone goes into the warehouse area, they have to sort of walk near the shipping and receiving, and the lights go on in that, that area, and they've got, you know, 20 or 30 lights that go on all the time, and, and no one's there. Uh, so you want to, you know, uh, you want to control your coverage so you're not having lights go on and off um, unnecessarily. And then task tuning, high-end trim. Uh, so that's you know typically when you're when you're doing even a even a fairly rigorous lighting design, it's hard given the vagaries of the fixture out the light output of the fixtures and then the spacing that you might need to actually 
you know, if your if your target illumination is say 30 foot candles, and you know you're trying to put in the fixtures, it may be that it's going to end up at 35 foot candles or 37 or whatever the number is, just because of the way they they lay out. Um, so you know that's not the end of the world. You you know more light is better than less than less light than coming under your targets, but um, if you're really trying to get a nimble design and maybe you're going for a uh, lead credit or you just want to save as much energy as possible, well, that extra five foot candles really isn't getting you anything. Uh, so this allows you to trim all those lights down. So you put in your, your design and then uh, you trim everything down, say, you know, uh, 8% or 12% or, or whatever the number is to get you to your target light level. And um, you know there can be other advantages uh, beyond just saving energy. Uh, if the lights aren't running at full capacity, um, they're running a little cooler, and uh, particularly LEDs are are happier when they're not uh, in a really hot environment. So um, you know if you were had to dim them 50 percent to get to your target light level, it just means you probably bought more fixtures than you needed, or you should have had a different lumen package instead of the 30,000 lumens, you probably should have had the, uh, you know, maybe the uh, 25,000 lumen uh, fixture, but that's a slightly different matter. So that's task high-end trim uh, and task tuning. And then time scheduling. Um, you know, a space like this, you could probably just say, well, every day at nine o'clock or by nine o'clock, we want the lights to just turn off. We don't really need a sensor to tell us that it's going to be plenty bright out even in the winter. Um, and so you can you can maybe keep it keep it kind of simple. Um, you do want to maybe have a, a timer that won't turn the lights on and off over the weekend if no one's around, uh, or maybe Sundays or or whatever if you have a a, a day that's you're closed. Um, so um, yeah, that's uh, it, it, sometimes it can be done just with simple simple timers. Uh, daylight harvesting. Uh, so you know that's a case where so this is in this if you look closely in this picture these lights are all off. We got uh, skylights, but it's nicely lit. So um, you know. Uh, it's not uncommon at all for me to walk into a well daylit space and see all the lights on. People don't notice. You know, you might be getting 100 foot candles of daylight in there uh, from a nice, uh, you know, sky, lots of nice skylights, and the the lights by themselves are hitting. You know, maybe your target light level is 30 foot candles, and someone you walk in in the morning and it's dark in there. You turn the lights on at 30 foot candles. Well, 100 foot candles of of daylight people won't won't know that the lights are still on they don't care uh, so you really want to have a sensor that can automatically dim them down or even turn them off uh, once the, once you reach your target threshold so those are traditional uh, strategies uh, dimmings uh, um, uh, occupancy uh, daylight harvesting um, but we're also seeing other th capabilities with um, LEDs that really weren't possible before. Uh, one is tunable white, um, and another is circadian lighting. And there are different things, and we'll talk a little bit about the differences and where they might apply. Um, and, and then we can also specifically control the spectral power distribution of the light if we want. Um, if there's a, a, another reason why we may want to do that. But we know that that uh, it can affect the mood and alertness. And um, uh, generally, like I say, we weren't able to do this before we had uh, LEDs. So tunable white is really, uh, here's, here's a picture in a classroom, but you, this could be, this could be, as we'll see, done in for other applications, but you know, where you are making choices to just change the mood, change the uh, alertness, change the feel. So it could be that, you know, early in the morning at 
say even in a warehouse, you want the lights to be, um, you know, very bright, maybe on the bluer end of the spectrum. Uh, then maybe they go back to sort of a more neutral setting during the day. And then maybe right around, you know, after the lunch. So maybe between, you know, 1.30 and, or whatever, 1 and, and, and 2.30, the lights are back up to a brighter setting with a little, maybe a little more blue in there. And then they can settle back into something else that's more typical uh, after people have, you know, had their uh, second break of the day or whatever. So just a... So this is really just a way to change things up a little bit, change the mood for, for different activities uh, for a different feel. Um, circadian controls are different. They, they are, they're often confused with one another. And that's the case, here's a, this is, and this is emerging research that's being done. Um, we're learning more and more about this uh, and, this is this is a study um, that uh, was done by the Department of Energy uh, with um, Pacific Northwest Laboratories, and um, they were looking in a, a ex, uh, extended care facility. And typically, what you would have in corridors uh, is just bright neutral lighting sometimes 24 seven, maybe they'll, you know, after like 11 o'clock at night, they'll turn things down to some low level um, or not. It just depends. Um, but here's a case where, you know, at night they were pulling a lot of the blue out. It was much lower light level during the day. Uh, they had uh, different settings that they could use. And it's a really interesting study. Uh, and I recommend if you want to learn more about that uh, and how it's affecting the uh, residents uh, as well as the staff um, to take a look. Um, and, and like I say, this is uh, uh, somewhat new research. Um, how might this work in a, in a warehousing application? So here's obviously medical uh, situation where here, you know, we've got uh, people looking for uh, small items, color discrimination is very important. You want to make sure you're, you're picking the, the right label. Um, so maybe in the, and, and again, this is concept only. We're just, I'm just sort of saying this is how it might might go. Uh, but maybe like in the morning, you might have a very blue light. You're maybe at 110% of your target. Um, then you get back, so that during the day, maybe you're at 4,000 Kelvins, maybe just a bright neutral color. Uh, maybe you've knocked it down from 100% of, of light output to 90%. You're still hitting your target. Um, and then in the evening, maybe you go to a much warmer, pull out some more blue from that uh, light, and then um, maybe there's a second shift coming in, and you've got it even dimmer still. Um, that could be a, a one type of scenario. Because as we see, you know, daylight changes throughout the day, the color, the intensity, the direction. Uh, so, um, you know, I think the jury's out as to whether electric light can stand in for daylight. Um, but certainly with LEDs, we get closer uh, to that possibility. Um, so, uh, but again, more research is needed uh, by uh, medical uh, and science. So here's this, many of you have been to our, our facility uh, recently. This is our classroom at our location in Soto. Um, and we had color tunable uh, lighting there. And um, so with the, uh, the blue end of the spectrum, uh, we were up at a uh, little, little over 6,000 Kelvins. We have a spectrometer, we can measure it. We had about 82 CRI. We were getting about 50 foot candles in the space. Um, we go to the warmer end of the spectrum, and we're down around 3,000 Kelvins, uh, still in mid 80 CRI uh, color rendering index, and still about 50 foot candles. Um, this space also had. Uh, ha 
solar tubes. So this is actual daylight coming in, about 5,000 Kelvins, uh, closer to 100 CRI, uh, only about 23 foot candles though, just in, in this case. Um, but uh, that same day under those same conditions, so I took the spectrometer out to the parking lot and we had over 600 foot candles. Um, so when we talk about electric light standing in for daylight, we do have to be aware that, um, you know, 50 foot candles in, inside is a fairly bright space, uh, but it's nothing like we would have outside even on a cloudy day. So, um, and we'll see there's, there's a variety of things that come to play. Uh, how does this impact, you know, industrial type facilities? You know, if you look at historic buildings, um, they incorporate a lot of daylight uh, because they didn't have a, the electric lights that we have now. You know, they might've had incandescent lighting or some, you know, even some, maybe some crummy old early generation fluorescence. But if you look at the scale of these windows, so these are these are big, big buildings. So here's the doorway. This is a probably a nine foot doorway. These are massive windows, big floor plate, narrow, so they were getting daylight deep into all of these spaces. Uh, so really the predominant activity in here is daylight driven. Again, same thing here, here's the doorway. Uh, again, probably a nine foot doorway, giant windows uh, all around. Now, of course, back then these buildings had um, single pane glass probably. So you really knew, you had a really good connection to the outdoors uh, when in the summer it was hot and in the winter it was probably chilly. So, um, and they used a lot of energy. So uh, yeah, we've gotten away from this kind of thing, but if we use modern windows, we can maybe have, um, still get those uh, big daylight spaces. And you know, we daylight's important. Uh, there's a huge amount of research going on, as I mentioned, uh, both, psychological, uh, uh, physiological, and non-visual effects, uh, again, affecting our circadian systems, impacting sleep. Uh, you know, it, it tends to, we see the effects on aging populations, but I think younger people are impacted too. They maybe they just don't show the effects quite uh, as readily. Um, modifying behavior, alerting functions, there's blue light hazard and flicker. Uh, are all associated with uh, light and health. And um, again, uh, light coming through the eyes uh, throughout the day. Uh, for millennia, it's all been dominated by daylight. And now we have 24-hour uh, activities that are going on at night uh, where there's very little brightness and we're not sure what the effect is. You know, another thing that was discovered uh, fairly recently, only in 2002, we identified a new photoreceptor. Um, you know, it's like we, we found something new in the human body that we didn't really know was there before. Uh, it's uh, light that comes through the eyes, but is not really vision related. Uh, it seems to affect uh, melanopsin. Um, you might've heard the term, uh, IPRGC, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Uh, and so that's what those sensors are. And um, studies suggest that they're, they're outside the rods and cones and unrelated to light response, uh, but are related to, um, or unrelated to vision, but are related to the uh, responsive circadian cycle. Um, so yeah, we see uh, non-vision forming. It's it's a slow response. It's it, the light needs to persist for a certain time. Um, affects pupil size and a variety of other things. So what are the key variables for uh, the these lighting the lighting stimulus? One is the intensity. Uh, one is the the distribution. What direction is the light coming from? Uh, the spectral power distribution or the, the color, generally speaking, uh, the duration, how long are we exposed, and then when are we exposed? And I'll try to clarify some of that. So the intensity is just how much light measured in either lux or foot candles. 
uh, and how much light enters the eye, and that gets into the direction a little bit. Um, typically measured at eye height, if we're doing certain kinds of, uh, like the well building standard wants to see light coming at a certain uh, height above the floor or above the, the work surface. Uh, the distribution, the direction of the light, so if we're in a really high space, most of the light's coming from above, but if it's a fairly low space, the angles are lower. So it may have a different impact, a different penetration in our into our eye. Um, the spectral power distribution, right? So here we have daylight. Uh, you know, incandescent light, which everybody loves, uh, has very little blue in it, lots of red. Um, you know, we're 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 not sure what what that's about, but uh, we're looking at some of the LED lights, and the cooler ones have a lot of blue um, and not much uh, red, and and then we can get some that have a lot less blue and are more uh, yellow green dominant. Um, and then we see fluorescent, and this would be true for high intensity discharge. They're so-called discontinuous light sources. Um, big gaps in the spectral range and then the duration and the dose uh you know so maybe you're working in a space and you're uh periodically going into a bright lit area and then you're going back to another another less brightly lit area and that goes on and on day often on throughout the day what's the impact of that uh, and we're not sure um, and then there's the timing right so um we like to have bright light in the morning uh, and maybe during the during the day and then less in the evening. But if you're working in a fairly dim warehouse, let's say, and then you you get off work and you go to a brightly lit store, um, what's the impact there? Uh, and so that's what we're we're trying to uh, trying to understand. Or maybe you're going, you, you know, you go to a uh, um, night school you know and it's uh, so you go to uh, a brightly lit classroom uh, till 10 o'clock at night not sure how that's impacting so anyway lighting controls to the rescue um, so the modern lighting systems and modern lighting controls allow us to control all of these things the intensity the distribution the spectral power distribution uh, the timing and the dose to some degree so I think it's a uh, it's a good uh, good opportunity. So you know uh, I've looked at lots of marketing material, and um, I think it's safe to say that you know we should stick to what we know. Uh, there's a lot that we don't know, and there's plenty of things that we don't don't know that we don't know. Like we didn't know, you know, if back in you know, 1999, we didn't know about intrinsically uh, uh, the IRPGCs. Uh, so um, we're finding out new things, and I think it's important to keep that in mind. Okay, pop quiz. All right, bear with me here. So I am launching it. Some of the key light stimulus variables are, please select those that count. Intensity, spectral power distribution, duration, dose, latitude, and timing. I take it one of these is not gonna be a... Uh... Well, sort of. <laughs> All right, keeping it for a few more seconds. Three, two, one. All right, sharing it out here. And hey, as as prescribed, we have everyone pretty much voted on everything. Uh, duration, those got 100%. Everything else got about 86. Latitude got a 14%. And that is correct. Latitude is not necessarily a huge that was, light stimulus variable. Yeah, that was a bit of a ringer there. I, it, Although it could be argued that latitude does affect on an annual basis um, the the overall yearly 
light stimulus. So it, it, it you know, because if you live in, uh, well, even Seattle, we have long summers uh, and short, dark winters. Um, so, yeah, you know, the latitude is, is a, could be a variable. But yes, it was basically A, B, C, and E. So thank you very much. Hardware. Um, you know, uh, everything's changed and uh, we're seeing um, various types of controls uh, changing from, you know, from just manual to computer controlled. You know, we have things and eventually the Internet of Things, it'll all just happen. We won't even really, it'll be built into everything. Um, we're not there yet, but uh, we're, we're kind of in this in this area. Um, one thing to point out, though, is along with the controls of the the evolution of the of the controls, has also been the evolution of the lighting. So you know we've gone from light sources that were harder to control to ones that are very easy to control a lot of the um, uh, characteristics. So um, I think it's a convergence of technologies right now. Um, so, all right, why do we want to use the advanced lighting controls? Uh, flexibility um, and productivity kind of go hand in hand. User satisfaction, uh, maintenance. Uh, there may be, there may be, uh, you know, maybe you're trying to do a lead building. Um, or a well building. Uh, there's various standards and uh, things that you, you might be needing to use the controls for. There's energy savings, of course. Uh, there's energy codes that might require controls, staff uh, wellness, and then aesthetics. And you might be thinking, well, this is a warehouse. Who cares about aesthetics? But you know, if people walk into a space and it's brightly lit and things seem to be working, um, they feel better about the space and I think they're going to want to come back. They're going to feel like it's a good place to be and they'll generally be more productive. So I don't, you know, I think we can't discount the, the aesthetics element um, too much. So let's look at what we might have in a typical warehouse floor plate like in the past. So You'd have, so here we have our basic warehouse. We've got some offices, we've got some restroom type spaces, we've got a little break room, and then we have uh, customer parking and maybe some loading areas. Um, so master switch or time clock for the warehouse area. So this big whole area would probably just be on, all on, uh, you know, early in the morning when the first people arrive. The main office, same thing. They just come on, you know, even if it's just one person arriving early, boom, the lights are all on. Um, you'd have, hopefully, uh, for the exterior, you'd have a photo cell, um, and those would be on all night, every night. And then the occupancy sensors, usually in the break room and the restroom. Let's just say that, you know, you're a little, you know, slightly modern, uh, or maybe it's a new enough building that the code required you to put the sensors. So that's the only place you might actually have sensors and a photo cell. Um, so if we were to uh, look at a different scenario, exterior lighting uh, zones uh, by photo cell and a time clock. So we'd have, this would be on one zone, the, so the customer, uh, staff parking, there'd be another zone here uh, for shipping, another zone here for receiving or whichever, um, potentially three, three separate zones. For the interior, we might have some daylight zones, right? So we might have daylight, we got windows here, we got some loading areas here with some windows, and we got a window in the break room. But wait, there's skylights. So now we've got a daylit warehouse space. That's interesting. 
so the way the the zoning works on a um, a skylight is it's basically 70 percent uh, of the of the mounting height from the outer edge of the skylight. Uh, so that that's what derives the size of the daylight zone. And we'll just to keep it simple. We'll say that the geometry of this space is such that this whole area becomes one big daylight zone. And then we have occupancy zones, right? So we don't want to have just one big occupancy zone. We want each aisle to have its own uh, occupancy zone. We want to have the um, open storage and the shipping in one. We want to have the receiving in another. And then we want to have the, some other handling in a different zone. Uh, we've got um, occupancy zone here for the rest for the um, break room we already had that the, the restrooms we got shipping and receiving office here we've got the main office and then we have a lobby all these are going to be separate little occupancy zones and then we have an occupancy zone for exterior for uh let's say the um receiving uh area in front of the doorway and then for the customer staff parking We'll see how that looks later. So we might have some sort of sequence of uh, operations, possibly for in, interior and exterior, maybe something like minimum 10% during regular hours for interior, uh, unless daylight is uh, three times the target. So the lights never really go out, but they go down to 10%, unless we got a lot of daylight, then they do go out. I also go to 85% upon occupancy for three fixtures around the activity. So if somebody comes into this aisle, just these fixtures go on and we don't go on, the lights on the back don't go on. The back aisle goes to 50% uh, upon any activity just to mitigate contrast. So that so persons walking in the aisle here, they they're not they're in, they're in light, but they also see light along the back a little bit. And then egress fixtures go to 110% upon egress event, power failure, fire, earthquake, et cetera, uh, due to lack of contribution. So there's just gonna be a few fixtures and because there's no contribution, we're gonna boost those up a little bit. And these in fact are the possible egress fixtures, one in the lobby here, one in, a couple in the office, uh, down this little corridor, uh, this corridor, everybody, everything leading out to this back door. We don't necessarily want to have people running out the loading dock uh, just because there could be a, a, a trip hazard uh, or there, the doors might be locked or who knows what, uh, but this would be the main egress path uh, and this would be here. So you combine all of that and you've got a very complex uh, zoning strategy uh, between the daylighting, the egress, the occupancy. Um, uh, so that would be tricky to do with um, discrete controls, uh, but we'll look at some network systems uh, that might be helpful. So here's one wavelengths. Uh, this is by um, uh, Cooper Lighting. Uh, signifies uh, Phillips and they're repped in the local a Seattle area by SeaTac Lighting. Um, and they, <clears throat> you know, one of the things I, I guess we're not going to do an exhaustive evaluation of these products, but one thing I was hoping to do was touch on them. One, to give you some uh, manufacturers' names to, to look at. And the other was just to sort of show that there's a lot of commonality between them. Uh, and then there may be some little differences too. Uh, so, um, so not to get too uh, frightened by uh, one product or another, uh, they all do a lot of this, the same things. Uh, so for instance, this product, the wavelengths can either be wireless or wired, or uh, you can also do a kind of a wavelengths light uh, that takes some of the complexity uh, out of the out of the system, uh, you've got uh, load controllers, 
uh, relay packs here. You've got sensors that can be used discreetly. Um, and then you've got a little app uh, that you can use to um, program it. You can do a combination of wired and wireless. Uh, or you can do one or the other, or you can you can do both. Some some spaces you might might be more applicable to doing a wired system, and other spaces uh, wireless might be uh, making more sense. Maybe for some of the exterior fixtures, uh, or for um, some of the larger spaces. And it might vary too if you're doing new construction or um, a retrofit. And then applicable again in uh, all these types of spaces. And they have a LLLC. All of these products you're gonna see have a luminaire level lighting control option. So this would be uh, from Cooper, this would be the Metalux, and they have others, but this is just one uh, that was you know, particularly suited to high bay. Um, so you've got your sensor on the fixture, uh, and showing how, you know, when you've got unoccupied and occupied space and you've got daylight uh, here, uh, you've got a timeout uh, where the space is unoccupied and then you go back to uh, occupied during with daylight. And it's, all of this represents uh, energy savings that, you know, might not have been present at all in, in some scenarios, maybe, especially with if you had metal halide. Uh, here's an application where they used it in a, a large, uh, case, not really a case study, but the connected lighting system uh, in in Spanaway, Washington. And not to mention the, the customer, but you might recognize the branding colors. The goal of the project was to provide a low maintenance, easy to use solution that would only use lighting in locations required for it. Uh, requiring it for use and avoid having lights burn all day for no reason. Energy savings uh, as a result of the zoned occupancy control is roughly 30 to 50 percent in comparison to a standard time clock. So this is a vast storage area and they were able to save uh, quite a bit of energy. So you know 50 percent uh, is a big number. All right, another pop quiz. All right, you're getting ready to launch it. So calling out, what are some of the common control strategies Eric has been going through? We have again, select all that apply, interior occupancy vacancy, daylight harvesting, task tuning, time clock scheduling, uh, labor and maintenance savings. So common lighting control strategy called out today. Thank you for those that voted. I'll be closing it in about three to five seconds. I see some boats still coming in. All right, let me close this out. Let's share. Everybody voted for interior occupancy vacancy, 86%. They like harvesting, but it's definitely one. 57% has tuning, which surprised me, but it's definitely uh, a control strategy we discussed, just like time clock scheduling that got 86% of the vote. Uh, and labor and maintenance savings at 57%, although the, that is a benefit of network lighting controls. That is not necessarily a lighting control strategy, but more so a benefit. Uh, Eric, I have a question here from, from uh, Walker Dots, and I'm not sure if we can speak much to it, but if you have any commentary, that'd be great. The question reads, uh, any data on cost increase between uh, standard lighting controls versus network lighting controls, or can you comment on that cost or a cost differential on labor and installation for network lighting controls and just standard controls? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, not specifically, but obviously right. it's going to be an, an increase in cost. Um, and I think it's important to to say, I mean, you know, standard lighting controls, you're looking at, you know, say an occupancy sensor uh, in, let's say, in 
maybe three or four sensors that are throughout a space, a big space, and they're just going to see when people come in and turn the lights on and leave. Um, so you can network that, and that, uh, once you want to network that system, so you, you can even have a simple system that you decide to put on a network, and all that really means is that you're going to start gathering data on uh, when those when those events occur, when the lights go on, when they go off, if they're responding properly. Um, so you're going to need probably some sort of um, uh, way to communicate to a computer. Uh, usually there's an interface in between the sensors and the lights and the actual computer, some sort of little black box. So you're buying some components, you're buying software. Um, you know, all these things require cost, but they also provide benefit. Um, that said, we do see occasionally cases where people get a lot of data and they're not really using it. So I think it's important for you as an organization or even as a specifier to talk to your client and find out what they're really interested in um, or what they have the capabilities for. If they just don't have staff to do anything with the data, then it may not be uh, anything that they're going to get benefit from. That said, sometimes people don't realize that they don't, you know, they don't know what they don't know. And they don't know that half the time, three of their aisles are, are almost empty uh, on a given week. And if they knew that, then they could um, save, save money and, and save energy. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's tricky. It's it's going to be an incremental cost, but th there is a benefit, uh, assuming that you have a party that's you know able to do something with that information. Does that does that make any sense? Definitely. No, thank you for the commentary, uh, Eric. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's um let's move on. I appreciate the question, though. It's a good one, and you know I I, I understand that I, you didn't get you know a yes or no answer, or a, you know it's going to cost you you know, $125 more. One thing I would say though, and we'll talk on the, touch on this later, is, you know, the utilities are very interested in having these systems deployed. Uh, and so they're providing incentives to help mitigate that, uh, that uh, additional charge. All right, uh, so here's a system by Hubble um, called NX. It's uh, repped by, Hubble is repped by Pacific Lighting Systems in Seattle area. And um, again, we can do a wired system, a wireless system, or a hybrid. Uh, one thing that this, just to touch on here, their app will work on both Android and uh, iOS, Apple um, platforms. And that's something to look at because we've seen some of these systems are only work one, one or the other. And so you do need to be sure that you're going to have uh, a, a an interface, a programming interface that will work um, f for what you're what you're what you're doing. And and again, we've got uh, load controllers, we've got sensor separate sensors as an option. Um, uh, going to um, Distributed intelligence uh, uses uh, digital distributed network or DNA, distributed network architecture. Um, the structure allows for this to scale from a single, so it can, you can really scale it up from a small space to a campus-wide, um, very flexible system. Here we've got a case where we've got a wireless area over here, maybe where we've got large spaces uh, a wired application here where it's maybe the space is a little smaller uh, and then a um, hybrid system where you've got some separate sensors uh, and separate um, controllers. Their LLC product is, or one of them is the uh, Peloton um, high performance uh again sensors built 
into the fixture uh, and it's in a high bay uh, type of platform. Digital Lumens, another company um, uh, uh, operated by um, Osram. Uh, and so they have their SiteWorks Sense, their SiteWorks Area, and their SiteWorks Tune. And those are all different flavors. I think you can get the combinations of those, but the SiteWorks Tune allows you to control various, uh, as we things we were familiar with, uh, occupancy, task tuning, daylight harvesting, programming, and automatic uh, setback. Their uh, SiteWork sense um, allows you to sort of monitor what's going on um, uh, looking at different processes different uh, utility uh, on-site utilities wastewater gas etc and environmental conditions are we seeing um, uh, humidity that's going too high or is, or is there a lot of noise in one area which might suggest something's breaking down um, so you can have a whole range of uh, uh, metering uh, going on there. And then there's um, SiteWorks area that allows you to, uh, you can do um, asset tracking, um, looking at what's happening in your zoning on a, on a monthly or annual basis, uh, and uh, look at what's happening uh, in the space as a whole. And they all, pretty much all their fixtures come with LLC. They were the one of the early ones to to adopt this, and now they've incorporated Bluetooth, um, so the so you can get a mesh network uh, between your uh, your fixtures. And um, yeah, they're been at it for a while. Um, Williams uh, has a product rep by Electrical Reps West their Link T Air. Uh, it's a fairly basic system, but uh, again, it might be perfect for what you're doing. Um, has an app uh, that you can use. Again, this so this is designed for Apple. Um, a lot of those around uh, it, where you can adjust, make your adjustments, and then you can start looking at your um, your uh, how your system's behaving. You can have um, the fixtures networked without sensors, or you can have sensors and network, um, and then you can have your various input devices. And I think it's important, as you know, as I was looking, there's a, if you start looking for um, particularly LLC fixtures, uh, there's a lot of them out there, but they aren't all suited for high bay type spaces. So, you know, so your typical LLLC fixture that you might put in an office, let's say, doesn't necessarily mean that that will work once you put it 40 feet in the air. Um, so you do need to look at the sensors that are part of that fi fixture package and will it be able to, you know, operate at these mounting heights. Um, a lot of them don't uh that are set up for just you know an office so you just need to look at that and and be careful uh they have their uh gh um high bay fixture um and and again it can uh operate it has a sensor that can handle those high mounting heights and then we have cree lighting uh synapse um as they're part of uh, form lighting. They're, they're repped rather by form lighting in the Seattle area. And again, we've got uh, standalone functionality out of the box um, <clears throat> with a local area network, or you can, or via a um, uh, Wi-Fi interface. Uh, this will handle up to a thousand fixtures um, per node, uh, so it's. Um, that's another thing to look at the capacity. Most of these high base uh, industrial systems can handle large numbers of fixtures, but that's something you need to be uh, sure about. Um, so uh, 
setting it up for uh, daylight harvesting, uh, program zones and scenes. And then uh, if you look here, this is the interface and you can see all, all of these are fixtures. Uh, and there were, I think, 3,000 fixtures on this project. Um, so each, there's a little uh, site controller, um, uh, the controller built into the, the high bay fixtures. And we've got a little, yeah, here we go. So this is their, uh, they did a case study with Uline uh, down in uh, Olympia area. And um, yeah, it was almost a million square feet, over 3000 fixtures. Um, and they got tremendous savings. Uh, again, when you're dealing with that many fixtures, you know, 30% savings uh, amounts to a lot of money. Uh, so the installation uh, of the system uh, it was extremely easy. The electrical contractor only had to worry about getting the power to the to the box, allowing them to save money on the installation. And that's from the Uline director. Um, and then by Acuity, uh, we have Enlight, um, and they're repped by the uh, lighting group in the Seattle area. Um, it's a distributed digital uh, lighting controls platform and it integrates all of these things that we've looked at. Um, so they have Inlight Air, which is their wireless and Inlight Wired, uh, which as the name suggests is wired. Uh, so your, all your sensors uh, use uh, data cables, Cat5. Um, and here they're just using a wireless controls they can be scaled up for single buildings or a campus wide um, or variations in between and and again if you're trying to incorporate a lot of exterior uh, the project can get large pretty quick uh, so acuity brands has uh, one of my personal favorites the ibg high bay I like to call it the notorious IBG, um, and it's got a LLC option, uh, and it's a platform that can take, you know, again, go from 8,000 to over 7,000, uh, over 70,000 lumens. Um, so, yeah. So the considerations, I think, when you're looking at specifying these systems, uh, should be ease of operation, ease of maintenance, and ease of installation. Uh, and that will help yield worker, worker productivity, safety, and well-being. Energy savings uh, is going to be there, um, but really these are the key elements. Um, additionally, you know, if these folks aren't happy, the system's not going to be a, a success. And one of the most commonly overlooked uh, commissioning elements is commissioning of the occupants. People need to know, why are we putting this in? What's it supposed to do? Why does it look dim over there? Uh, and and what's happening to the lights when the daylight comes in? It looks like they go off. Well, yeah, that's not a problem. You've got more light than, than you had when they were on and there was and it was dark. So you did. Just education is good uh, so people understand what's going on. Um, you know, and it, this is a very basic, simple sequence of operations, but, you know, people often say, well, we want an astronomical time clock. Well, what are, what are the schedules? You know, when are the holidays? Um, how, do we, how do we put those in? What's happening on those? You know, which sensors are vacancy and which are occupancy? Um, what are the timeouts? Is it 15 minutes? Uh, usually out of the box, they're, f they're half an hour, I think, and 15 minutes is code in some areas, so you have to change it. Um, what are the target light levels for task tuning? You know, you, you can't necessarily just say, oh, well, we're going to have everything go down 15 or 10%, because that may get you below where you need. So you might need to, you might need to be 5% in some areas, it could be 20% in other areas. Um, which are dimming, which are switching, uh, where the daylight uh, zone dimming thresholds, 
right? So, you know, if your target is is 30 foot candles, uh, maybe you don't want the lights as the daylight comes in to really start dimming until you get about you know 40 foot candles of daylight, just so you don't have kind of a dip in there. Um, so just all those things need to be asked and addressed. Okay, another pop quiz. All right, let me bring it up here. And I am launching. It reads, more important than energy savings, which are the key considerations for a successful control strategy? So out of, outside of energy savings, what are these what are these benefits that that controls adding controls on a project bring together? So seeing that we're not catching people anymore, we have a good amount of people voting for the correct benefits. I keep this on for three to five more seconds. All right, I'm sharing these results. We have, you know, 75% for both ease of operations and ease of maintenance, 88% on worker productivity, 100% on worker safety with controls. I like that. And no one voted for decreasing the life of fixtures because they actually do the opposite. They increase the life of fixtures. But are the other ones were correct. Excellent. Well, if I can't fool you, that means that's that's good. That's good. All right, let's forge ahead here. Not getting anywhere, let's try it now. Ah, okay. So here's our floor plan. We were looking at that earlier. And um, let's see if we put LLC fixtures in this space, so that means each fixture has its own set of sensors, daylight sensors, occupancy sensors. Um, what are we gonna, what kind of results might we see? So let's go through a little scenario here. And remember, but the earlier scenario, we just had all the lights were on here, all the lights here, and all the lights outside um, on all night. So here, let's say it's nighttime. We've got a minimum of 10% uh, for egress uh, in these, so let's just say these are glowing dimly. Um, and in the parking area, we've got 30% just so the parking lot's not dark. But no one's around, nothing's moving, nothing's happening. The business has been closed for a while. And then we have somebody arrive. Early entry, ambient light. So right here, the ex exterior parking goes to 90%. Um, person comes in to the lunchroom. Uh, then they walk to the restroom. And then they go into the shipping and receiving area. This may be, say, this is the shipping manager. And she's, she's there early uh, getting some things ready. And then we have uh, somebody arrives here. They come into this parking lot. Now notice this one's gone down uh, to the parkings off. Uh, the warehouse is, is, is dark. The shipping rec and receiving office is lit because that person's in there doing some work. Um, but because it's before business hours, things are kind of dark in here. Um, this person comes in, they go to the restroom, and then they go sit at their desk. And that's kind of where things are. Uh, oh, I should say, if we go back just briefly. So the, the ambient here, this is up at 30%. So it's not dark in there, but the racking is dark because no one's really been in there and that's just how you've programmed it. But this area is sort of, is at 30%. Um, these areas are at 90%. Um, so 
just want to point that out. Uh, now it's early morning. Um, business is open. People are in the ambience at 50%. Uh, occupied areas are at 90%. We've got somebody in here receiving. We've got somebody here in the shipping area. Uh, we've Someone's gone in and out a few of these aisles. The office is fully occupied and the uh, someone's in the men's room. Um, so, but again, this aisle, these aisles are, are dark uh, and these are at 50%. And the exterior lights are off because it's, it's daylight, but it's not uh, very bright out. So now it's midday and we've got um, the ambient lights are off in the daylit areas. Uh, they're at 50% in these secondary areas. So the electric light's on, but they're at 50%. Shipping and receiving is still occupied. It's, it's at 90%. This guy's still in the bathroom. Uh, the daylight is uh, coming into the office. So these lights are, are mostly off, at, but the rest are at 50%. Um, someone's in the restroom here. Daylight, daylight. So we can see there's a quite a bit of savings going on um, compared to what we had earlier in that first slide where we pretty much everything was just on full. Um, and, and you, you know, it's, you can do that with discrete controls, but if you've got L, LLC, they're all doing their own little thing there and the zoning is so much easier. Um, A lot of people say, well, how much is, you know, this maybe dresses a little bit, the the costs, uh, you know, of these systems, um, somewhat wired versus wireless though, but, you know, for a wireless system, uh, the parts might be a little more expensive. You're buying these, you know, little radios or, or cellular uh, SIM card things, um, but the labor is very low. Uh, with the traditional wired system, your labor's high, your parts may be less money, uh, but then you've got to be other other painting and mitigation if you have to, you know, install uh, the wiring in a, in a way that's um, not, not going to be showing. Uh, there's all these different uh, protocols and ways of doing wireless. Um, need to be concerned a little bit when you're putting in wireless that sometimes obstacles and mass are going to get in the way. Sometimes you need line of sight. Uh, distances, you know, in a lot of little office spaces or classrooms or, you know, schools, the distances are a factor, but not that big a factor. But, you know, like that Uline warehouse, that was, you know, 800,000 square feet of, of the space. Uh, so you may, you know, certain, you either need repeaters or else you're using a mesh where, where the, the, uh, signals are going from one fixture, one node to the next. And so every, so it all, you know, carries, but there could be latency when you have a really big system like that, um, may not be a factor. It just depends on how quickly things need to react. Um, the number of devices per node could be a factor, again, once you're dealing with very large spaces. Um, so, yeah. Uh, cybersecurity is, uh, has been a factor, is still gonna be a factor, it'll be a factor tomorrow. Um, but, you know, the security is getting better. One thing I think you should, this should keep in mind if you're bringing this up with a, an owner. Um, so just because you're putting in a network doesn't mean you're necessarily touching on their network. So this can be a separate network that's not touching on security or mechanical systems. I mean, you can get network systems that are fully integrated where your cameras and your other mechanical systems and all of that is all built into one big framework or not. If they're nervous about um, security, this can be a totally independent standalone network. Uh, so um, it can go either way. 
depending on their level of uh, of concern. And then parts of it could be wired, which would be potentially more secure. Um, you know, Flickr is something that we kind of got away from with fluorescent lighting in um, an electronic ballasts when we were looking at uh, lighting in industrial applications. It, it was a problem with high intensity discharge. You could get and magnetic ballasts. You could get this um, strobing such that it might make rotating machinery look like it was stationary and there'd be a safety issue. Um, with LEDs, there's the potential for flicker to become a problem again. It's not not necessarily a given, but it is a concern. Um, so uh, you want to be aware of that. Um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, there's an interesting article here if you want to find out more about that. At the end of uh, 2021, the new commission regulating uh, Flickr enters force. This specific requirement for LED light sources are changing completely. Completely new minimum requirements for Flickr and the so-called stroboscopic effect are introduced. So, um, you know, with Flickr, uh, and we'll look at it in the next slide, you know, it can be okay. A little bit of Flickr may not be a problem. Uh, it might be mildly annoying, but you know, people just deal with it. Maybe it's a space that's rarely occupied. It can be hugely annoying, or it can be a disastrous and or a big safety issue. So, just because there's some flicker doesn't necessarily mean it's got to be uh, eliminated. Um, so, you again, you're looking at the quantity of flicker, the frequency of the flicker and whether it's a uh, low risk, no effect, or high risk. And that's a way to kind of uh, look at how that might uh, graph out. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, you know, are we, uh, I think, one thing that, to bear in mind is that it's going to be slow to get everybody using network lighting controls, but I think it's going to be eventually, uh, that will become the norm. Um, how soon it takes and what they look like, you know, when we get there a, a decade from now or two decades or, or or whenever that is, is is hard to say, but we will eventually get there. Internet of Things, I mean, that's right around the corner. Uh, you know, we're seeing some bumps in the road in terms of, uh, you know, security and uh, some other things, but we're seeing all kinds of systems that are networked um, and uh, a lot of it's positive. Some of it's like, gee, I didn't really know I needed to do that. Um, and others are like, wow, this does this thing. I never thought of that before. And it, it gives us functionality and, and, uh, and helps us. So, um, yeah, uh, asset tracking is one that's certainly relevant in large spaces, large complicated spaces like hospitals and schools, but even, you know, certainly warehouses. Tracking material is something that makes complete sense. You know, where is this pallet of, uh, that we received two days ago? Is it, uh, but it can even be things like, where's the forklift? Or we've got 10 forklifts, we're only seeing eight. One of them must be someplace. Um, another uh, could be, you know, tracking personnel. You know, you need to know where the the maintenance, the head maintenance staff are at a given point uh, in case there's a breakdown. Um, tracking the the um, the uh, where the uh, trucks are. All those things um, really streamline uh, how a warehouse can function. Uh, here's a case where Signify, um, working with a glass uh, manufacturer, um, uh, using asset tracking technology, uh, equipped the automotive warehouse with LED luminaires linked to sensors to gather information to translate, uh, transmit it for data analysis, helping managers improve the operations. So, you know, 
Um, like I say, I think we're going to start seeing more and more of this. Um, it's just a case of how we get there. Li-Fi. So we've heard of Wi-Fi. Li-Fi is, is uh, light uh, information traveling over, over light as opposed to radio waves or cellular or uh, wires. It would be light. And uh, it's a, it's a big, much bigger spectrum. Um, potentially, there's more security in that it's uh, line of sight. Um, the the only thing that we're seeing is that it's uh, it's going to be a little while, I think, before we're dealing with large amounts of electricity or large amounts of information going through, uh, you know, personal devices. Uh, that's sort of the the promise, and it's it's also likely not going to actually be built into the visible light portion. It may be mounted on luminaires or not, um, but it probably won't be. Uh, part of the lighting, um, it'll probably it may be light, it may be even be visible light, but it probably won't be part of the the light system. At least that's where things are looking now. Um, you know, uh, these can be in new buildings or or retrofit uh, LLC in particular. Um, can replace existing luminaires one for one, um, you know, and really the, the beauty of that is you're just, you know, you've got the space already wired, you've got your traditional lighting and you've got power there. All you have to do is hook the power back up to this new fixture and the controls are baked into it. Uh, so it's, it, it's simpler in that way. And they are, you know, sort of by definition, wireless control elements. Uh, so at that point, from the ground, you're just, um, you know, zoning and uh, doing things uh, from from an app or a, or a laptop or something. So we've seen the uh, nine one nine ninety rule. Um, you know, again, uh, energy and resources space and layout, wellness and productivity. These are the things that really are your, your biggest concern um, to, uh, to yield um, you know, positive results. Okay, another, uh, another question. Should be the last uh, pop quiz of the day for everybody. It is about Flickr. As we were covering Flickr, Flickr from the lighting, what might it be? Select all that apply. It could, all right, okay. Flickr could be mildly annoying, hugely annoying, disastrous, or not as bad as IT issues. <laughs> Thank you for voting. See them coming in. I'll leave for about three more seconds. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close this up and share. Everyone uh, put it at a 50% level on okay, mildly annoying, hugely annoying, and disastrous. Uh, and as bad as IT issues, got 33% because it probably <laughs> may be true, but uh, but but good 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 spread, guys. Oh yeah, can't fool you. Um, <clears throat> So the other thing, just a little shout out is, you know, I mentioned earlier, uh, the utilities are are eager to help with this. And, um, you know, part of, I mean, we're, we're one of the pieces of that puzzle, the lab is, uh, but they've got lots of staff on, uh, people on staff too, who can help uh, with implementation um, and, uh, and support. So um, definitely reach out to them and and try to uh, if you're thinking about one of these uh, projects. So 
one of the considerations, especially if you're thinking about luminaire level lighting controls or even a network lighting control is the difference. So they put in savings uh, assumptions based on the type of control and the type of space. And usually the baseline when you use LLLC is a little higher, not in every case, uh, than if you're using um, a traditional network lighting system where you have components that you're putting together. So um, it doesn't hurt to find these things out uh, in advance. Um, and again, you're, whether you're looking at uh, prescriptive uh, incentives or savings, and uh, when you go to LLC, you also get a bonus um, for those measures. A uh, couple things we've got on, uh, in addition, if you're wanting more information on this, is on our website. Uh, we have these uh, videos that we did, um, starring none other than our own Armando Berdiel. Uh, a nice little set of videos that we did on LLC. We also have uh, these best practice guides, um, help you uh, get your mind around that. And then we also have in our uh, resource guides, um, a little a couple one pagers, one on uh, warehouse controls, another one on network lighting systems controls. So that I think is just about it. Uh, there is a new report that was that came out, um, worked on by uh, University of Oregon uh, Luminaire Level Lighting Controls Replacement versus Redesign Study, and um, they were uh it's a it's it's pretty short it's it's worth checking out and um just you know neo worked uh funded that uh done it with university of oregon and um this should get you everything you need uh to see how that went some other resources if you're interested in some of the um research on um uh Day on light and uh, uh, how it affects uh, the, our physiology. And I think that's it. Uh, appreciate your time. And I think Armando, I'm going to turn it over to Armando. Uh, any of you remembered uh, my dog Stella? She passed away, but now I have Olive. She's uh, another little black lab. Uh, so again thank you and I, we're just a little bit ahead of time so there'll be time for questions if anyone has any uh and i think armando's going to take us out all right and eric I saw your new lab and it is a lot bigger than the picture oh my god they grow so fast <laughs> i know uh wanted yeah wanted to call out that on april 20th 10 a.m through noon, we will have a network lighting control class for healthcare space, a healthcare vertical network lighting control class. And now just calling out that today's slide deck and a recording of today is going to be at our website, lightingdesignlab.com. Whenever you do see us on our website online, you can click on the resources tab and, and you'll see past, uh, past recordings as well as the handouts same as the education tab will be a menu for that you'll see uh, eric's contact information on on the board and you can always email us if there are questions uh, i wanted to thank south city light that we are a part of and member utilities that supported us in 2020 uh, we still give them a shout out so thank you for these utilities that participate and engage with us and i do believe that brings us all to a close there are no additional questions and i think uh, we're calling it a wrap Thank you, everybody, right. for joining us. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time.